are back and also welcome to our book club entitled The Social Chapter. Today we are discussing one of the most talked about books of the entire year. Hey, that would be The Testaments by <laughs> Margaret Atwood. <laughs> Months when she became the oldest woman to ever receive the prestigious Booker Prize. So Jess is social chapter president. Why don't you give us a quick synopsis of the Testaments? So we all remember The Handmaid's Tale, which has been read around the world, including many a classroom, and has since been turned into an Emmy award-winning show. Well, The Testaments is its sequel, and the story picks up 15 years later and returns to the totalitarian world of Gilead. Now, unlike the first book, this story is told through three narrators. Aunt Lydia, who is the infamous tyrant in charge of The Handmaid's, and two other characters, Daisy, a young woman in Gilead who's about to be married off to a commander, and Agnes, who lives in Toronto. Mm -hmm. So the book dives deep into Aunt Lydia's past and reveals how she became to be an instrumental part in upholding the repressive laws of Gilead. And we learn that Daisy and Agnes have this shared past together. Ooh. Ooh. Okay, Jess, well, you brought along some food that we read a lot about in the book. So what's the significance of these oranges and eggs? Well, you remember there's a scene where there's a big giant statue of Aunt Lydia and all of the other ants place eggs and oranges at the foot of the statue. They're sort of signs. They represent fertility, obviously, eggs. And if you're not fertile in Gilead, well, you know, get the heck out of town. <laughs> and the oranges are this, this luxury sort of item, a, a real sign of prestige and so on. So I brought those along. Uh, they don't look too appetizing for us to dive into, <laughs> but this wine sure does. <laughs> so Jess, yes, it does. What did you bring us? So we are sipping on the Audacity of Thomas G. Bright Chardonnay, which is now available at the LCBO. And it's a perfect pairing for this novel because this book obviously has Canadian roots and so does its wine. It's an Ooh. ode to Canadian winemaker Thomas G. Bright, who is known for transforming the Canadian wine industry because he was the first person to bring over European vines. Ooh, Ooh. Lovely, huh? lovely. we likey. Okay, so <laughs> this book uh, got mixed reviews from fans with some debating whether a sequel can ever be as good as the original. So ladies, I want to hear what you all thought of this book. Does it live up to its predecessor? We'll each give it a rating out of five and then spend 20 seconds defending our rating. Jesse, mm. after you finish that wine, <laughs> take a gulp. You go first. Very good. <laughs> I gave this book a 3.5 out of five and here's why. You know how some books are beautifully written, others have a gripping plot, but the best books have both? This is not one of those books for me. It took me 100 pages to get hooked, and by then it was the plot that really propelled me forward, not the writing, which sort of spelled out major plot points over and over again, sort of hammering them home, just in case I missed it, like it was a grade five reader, and I'm reading it at least a grade six level. <laughs> I'm on the other end of the spectrum. I gave this book a five out wow. of five. Wow. And here's wow. Fa wh why? <laughs> I found the testament to be a deeply satisfying sequel to The Handmaid's Tale. Omnipotent Aunt Lydia's backstory is revealed, and it's a reminder that even the strongest empires fall, and most often they crumble from the inside out. Trump, Johnson, are you listening? But where The Handmaid's Tale was full of darkness, despair, and hopelessness, this novel glimmers at the edges with light, optimism, and a possibility that good wins over evil. <laughs> And then the pendulum swings all the way to the other side. Yet again, I gave this book a three out of five. Here's oh. why. The Handmaid's Tale is one of my favorite books. Years ago, after interviewing Margaret Atwood, I broke a reporter's rule and actually asked her to sign my tattered copy. So it was with huge anticipation that I cracked open the testaments. It didn't grip me. Maybe it was a three-character narration format that threw me. A sequel rarely lives up to the original. That is sadly, sadly the case here. Whoa, okay. Sin. Okay. Whoa. I gave it this book a 3.5 out of 5, and here's why. First, let me say I adore Margaret Atwood. We reviewed The Handmaid's Tale during a social chapter a few years ago right here, and I gave it my first 5 out of 5. But the world has changed quite a bit since then, and to be honest, because of that, it made this entire reading experience really stressful for me. It took place in Toronto. I felt like I was in it. Ultimately, <laughs> this book unfortunately feels less like fiction and more like prophecy, and it just wasn't delightful for me. Oh, <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. all. Fascinating. Fascinating. Okay. This book gave us a narrator, as you mentioned, who uh, we didn't expect, which was Aunt Lydia. Did this at all, so Aunt Lydia, of course, she is from the series, she wasn't in the first book, and uh, did this give you a different perspective on her? 
I think I, I love to learn about her, that she was a judge and how she mm -hmm. came to power, but I think that was my issue right there, that I wish that she was the only narrator. We ah. had three, and I would have been fine if Lydia narrated this whole thing. Just to see it through her Just eyes. Just to see didn't, it through her didn't eyes. Didn't it give you a little bit of sympathy for, for Lydia? It did. Yes. Like, you did sort of put yourself in that situation, and, and how would you have reacted? Like, you, she basically had two choices, and she took one path instead of death. Yeah, she was <laughs> it makes you question, like, what would we do if suddenly tomorrow all of our rights as women were stripped, suddenly our bank cards aren't working, we're told we can't work anymore, and we're brought into this area, and we're tortured. This is essentially what happens. Who do you become? Do you become yeah. an Aunt Lydia, a survivor, somebody who doles out abuse? Yeah. Or do you die, Check basically, out. because well, you don't want to do it? Uh, uh, Margaret Atwood has always said that she doesn't write about anything in the books that doesn't ha already has, mm -hmm. hasn't already happened in history or currently, and so it makes you think about people like, um, you know, former SS Nazi soldiers who were basically making a choice. You're either going to do this right. or you die. And it makes you realize that given the situation, what would you do? You hope that the person's gonna choose correctly. Aunt Lydia did not. No. Did well, not. but, th but well, then that's her but last th final act is letting her know. Yeah, but then. Oh, spoiler, spoiler! Just don't spoil it! Don't spoil it! <laughs> okay, so Margaret Atwood <laughs> said this book, <laughs> She said this book would answer all of fans' burning questions about Gillian. So do you guys feel like you got the answers that you wanted? Ooh. No, and I have one question for the great Margaret Atwood. Why did you write it? Oh, oh you didn't know, want questions uh, no, answered. I didn't, and I, and feel... I, I felt, you know what? Handmaid's Tale is a masterpiece. And my feeling is don't mess with a masterpiece. Leave it alone. I can live with a couple of unanswered questions here and there. I don't want to live with a book that doesn't live up to what it should well, be. Well, I actually like the, fi the fact that I didn't feel there were a hard answers at the end of the book. That was actually the best part of the book for me. You know how I was saying in my review that she sort of crossed all her T's and if you didn't get something, she told you again and again, this is someone. And then the other character says, yes, that is someone. It's like, yeah, I get it. So when she left the, the ending sort of a bit open for me, I was like, bravo, mystery's fine. Mystery is fine in, in fiction. But you know, Margaret Atwood has caught, uh, caught the TV bug because this book specifically picks yes. up 15 years after the end of The Handmaid's Tale, which is very convenient for a TV show that's still on the air because that show can then run away with the plot and then it sort of picks up those 15 years later. So I think she is thinking cinematically yeah. and I'm I here for right. it. I am I'm yeah. here for Smart. it. She doesn't want to be like George R. R. Martin right. who still hasn't finished writing Game of Thrones. Is that a true story? <laughs> It is true. That man will never finish it. So bravo to Margaret Atwood yeah. for being like, I'm gonna tell the rest of this story and you guys, you TV people can follow my lead. Exactly. Yeah. There you go, exactly. there you go. Okay, so it's time now to reveal our next social chapter selection. Jess Allen, take it away. May I have a drum roll, please? Our next social chapter selection is Dear Girls, Intimate Tales, Untold Secrets, and Advice for Living Your Best Life by Ali Wong. That was a mouthful. It's also funny, raunchy, and raw in a hilarious series of letters to her daughters. Comedian Ali Wong offers honest stories about her life and talks about everything from marriage to motherhood to marginalization. And I can't wait to read this one. I actually started last night, and no joke, I read like three pages and I started laughing in bed and Simon was like, it's funny already in three pages. I was like, yes, it was! <laughs> Uh, I'm ex I haven't started reading yet, but I'm very, very excited to. And we will be reading this with a glass of wine, obviously. And that is why we will specifically be sipping on Inniskillen Pinot Noir with this read. Uh, everyone in our studio audience, get ready to read along with us because you're getting your copy of Dear Girls Today. Okay, so audience and anyone who's reading along with us, make sure to share your thoughts with us. Use the hashtag, the social chapter. Happy reading. Cheers, ladies. And